I didn't put it up there. No, you didn't. No. <laughs> you for killing me. Really? For real. <laughs> you'll, right. you'll have another homework assignment this week, and then next week will be your last class, and you'll have a final homework assignment and paper. And that's it. Hold on, we're a little late. So that means you have two papers or just one? You have one paper this week. Right. And one homework assignment this week. Next week, you'll have a paper and a homework assignment. Okay, well, so we, we can discuss this. I can give you an in-class test instead. <laughs> Programming questions. <laughs> so, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to do that. If you uh, would rather have an in-class exam... <laughs> so, the way I thought it would be the fairest for everybody is just to give uh, a final um, assignment. And then what I can do is I can drop your, um, your, your worst two homework assignments. Okay. So, if people are happy with the grade they've gotten in all their homework up until after after next week. My bad. There's a fly around my face. <laughs> <laughs> they're, if, they're, if they're happy with uh, how they've done, then they could technically skip that last assignment in the last paper, have those be their drops, and be done with the class next week. When you say two assignments that you dropped, you mean like one homework and one paper, or like two, any, two ever, anything? The lowest event. Yeah, I treat all of them as equal equal weight. You have to update that in the grade book because it's slowly and slowly. No, well, they should all be equal weight, but I, I can I can update that. But that, I mean that should be easy math, right? Yeah. The programming ones are rated at thirty five points total, and the math ones are rated at thirty five points total. Oh, really? Hmm. Well, so then what's the rest of the, so that's 45%, what's the rest of the 55%? <laughs> no, I mean, no, that's the point total, but the percentage-wise doesn't, like, say you got 9.5 points out of the thing, mm. you get 95% in that little section. Oh, 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 I, I, I get it, I get what you're saying. Yeah, so what I'll treat everything as an equal assignment. So every paper is worth the same amount as every program. Um, and then I'll drop your two lowest. So if you've got two zeros, whether it's two zeros on a paper or a zero on a program and a zero on a paper or a 50 on a program and a 50 on a paper, whatever it is, your two lowest of any of those I'll drop. So if you like your grade coming into, you know, after this week's homework, you could technically not do the homework I'll assign next week. Get zeros in both of those, have them automatically dropped, and then get your grade in the class. I'll actually, I usually give you two weeks for that last one. The last one's a little bit bigger project, and some people do travel and, and things like that, so... Um, I'll probably have it due kind of like maybe second week in January or something like that. Um, I don't know. Whenever they start yelling at me. So I usually give you two weeks. And actually it's unlocked right now. So you can actually start working on it right now if you wanted to go and look. There's one paper. Really? Well, I don't know. It's whatever's up there. It's just a final project? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, it sounds like you guys might get off easy here. Like you look for... Oh, so today's homework is this. Yeah, I guess there's just a final project, not even a final paper. I'll still drop two, though. I'll still drop two. <laughs> what you have left in this class is the homework I'll assign today, the paper I'll assign today, and the final project that I'll, ass I'll assign next week. So you can start working on that. It's already unlocked. It's out here. I think so. And then I'll drop your two lowest of anything. Sound good? Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, so what's yeah, what's what's next week? Eleven. Yeah. Yeah, until Christmas. Uh, yeah, that sounds legit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's due by Christmas. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, I don't listen to that crap. <laughs> And you will remember all of this, right? It's recorded. All of what? This discussion right here. Which part of it? Specifically the I'll drop two, two assignments part? And the whole, um, well, I know you remember that part. So everything up there. Awesome. <laughs> 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 one thing, but no. So, in the grade book. Yeah, when I actually go and calculate grades, I'm, I'll... I bring it into something else. I don't use Angel's grade book. Oh. So, that's, uh, well, I, I, I fully intend on fixing it on Angel. <laughs> okay. I'll throw it, I'll throw it out there that way. Um, let's see, what are we doing now? I'm debating. Okay. Let's, let's make a game. Your homework assignment for today is going to be around making a uh, the start of a card game. So I want to look at uh, a game, hopefully all of you have played, a game called Connect Four. Anybody not play Connect Four? It looks like this. So Connect Four looks like this. We have a, um, a seven by, what is this, six? Seven columns by six rows grid and some player goes first they drop a checker in here and then the next person it's there the goal is to get four checkers in a row of the same color either horizontally vertically or diagonally okay that's the that's the goal now what I'm going to do is when I make my move, I choose the column I want to drop my checker in. And that checker drops as far down that column as it possibly can go. So if I choose this column, it falls all the way down. If I choose this column here, it'll fall down as far as it can go but land on top of this checker. Oh, he blocked me. And can this can this machine be beaten? What's up? Yeah, go. Yeah, go to the Yeah, go there and then he'll block off and then he'll block off. Yeah, but now if I don't do that. Block it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but hold on. I've uh, I'm gonna do. How do you beat a computer? I see. He isn't he's on like autopilot? <laughs> ESPN? Oh. <laughs> All right, so we understand how the game works? Yeah. All right, so we need to represent our board, for starters. So we're going to create this game. And uh, we're going to make it so that a human can play a human, for starting. We're not going to create a computer artificial intelligence or anything. So what goes into Connect Four? So Connect Four game has a couple of pieces. We need checker objects. So we have checkers, we have a board, and we have a player. So if you think about this in real life, if we were going to sit down and play Connect Four, we'd have our board in between us. You'd have two players sitting there, and each of us would have a pile of checkers. 
and then you start making start making moves. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's talk about these one at a time. What's a checker? And what designates my checkers from your checkers? The color. Color. That's it. Checker is a color. Okay, so I'm going to actually create for this guy, I'm going to create a brand new project. We've been screwing around this Hello World project for long enough. So I'll go File, New, Java Project. We'll call this guy Connect. Connect. Four. We'll create a new class, and we're going to call this guy Driver for playing the game. Okay. And here I just usually do a little system about that print then. Hello world. Make sure everything's hooked up correctly. There we go. Okay. Now. We're going to go ahead and we're going to create a checker object. Okay, class. This guy is going to be called a checker. Now, a checker, we decided, is just a color. Correct? So we're going to say private string color. And when we build a checker, We'll take a color as a parameter, and we'll say this dot color is equal to color. That's our starting point for a checker. Make sense? Okay, now let's go back out to driver and let's create a couple of checkers. So what are my colors? Red, black, your typical checker colors. So I'll create a checker C1 is equal to a new checker. Red, checker C2, is equal to a new checker, black. And then, just for right now, let's go ahead and teach checkers how to display themselves. will display the letter A, followed by a color, followed by a space checker. So a red checker or a black checker is what the display method will do. That make sense? So I'll go back to driver, and I'll say c1.display, and then I'll say c2.display. And there's our a red checker and a black checker. Now what will happen if I say system dot out dot print lens C1 and system dot out dot print lens C2? What will my output be? Memory addresses? So two crazy memory addresses, right? Now let me show you something here real quick. What will the output be now? Exact same. 
memory addresses. Now, the thing we want to understand here is that what does the println method do when we call it passing it a object? So let's go look at the documentation. And I'm going to go to java.lag here, and we're going to look at alphabetical order. Nope. And we'll look at system. And here's out. It's actually a print stream. Well, here, actually, let me show you this. Show you this. I don't think I've shown you this before either, right? The out variable? Okay. So I am in a class called system that lives inside java.lang. Now notice that inside system I have some fields. What's a field? If you had to concisely tell me what a field is, what would you say? Okay, are fields variables? Fields are variables. Fields are variables that a class owns. So here's my list of fields for the system class, and here's a bunch of methods for the system class. Notice we have a field here called out. Is this a class field or an instance field? How do you know? Static. It's a class field because it has static in front. And its definition. How do we call class fields? It's the name of the class in which the field was defined. So I would call this field using the name of the class system.out. Make sense? Now, um, system.out is actually a variable of type print stream. So I'll go to that print stream class. Doesn't matter if we know what a print stream is. We just know that out is one of those. System.out is one of these guys. Now I'll scroll down here, and amongst other things, we will see a whole bunch of versions of println. Here's a println. Here's another one that takes in a boolean, a char, a char array, a double, a float, an int, a long, an object, a string. What's it called when you have a bunch of methods with the same name but a different number in or type of parameters? <laughs> Polymorphism. All right, so it's called polymorphism. Now, in any case, notice what happens when we print out an object. So there's a version of this that takes an object as a parameter. So if I print out a Boolean, I expect it to print a true or false. If I print out a char, I expect it to print out a character. If I, print a, if I print out a double, a number, a float, a number, an int, a number, so on and so forth. If I print out a string, I expect it to display the content of the string. But object is kind of our catch-all. Everything else we create is an object. Fraction is an object. Even though we didn't actually write the code, if I would go into my fraction class in here, it was invisible, but this guy said extends... That was in there, okay? So a fraction is an object. Well, how does the println method know what it means to display an object? If I tell it to print out a fraction, how does the println method, something that was written months and months and years and years ago by somebody that was not in this room with us tonight, how does it know how to print out what we are calling a fraction? They couldn't, right? They had no way that, of knowing we were going to create a fraction class and what it means to display a fraction. So they have this one catch-all version of println. And this guy takes in anything that is an object. The only object type that it's done as a special case are strings. 
it says, oh, if you pass in a string, we know how to deal with that. But anything else? Any other kind of object. We're going to treat you as a generic object. And what we'll see is generic objects, so I go to the object class. Notice this guy has no, has no parent. This is the top of the hierarchy. If I click back here for a second, I scroll all the way up to the top. Notice the print stream. Its parent is fil uh, what, filter output stream, whose parent is output stream, whose parent is object. So this guy is parent, grandparent, great-grandparent. So a print stream's great-grandparent is the original object. Does that make sense? Now, notice that object has no parents. This is the beginning. Okay? All object-oriented languages are going to have a top-level object class. It might not be called object, it might be called something else, but Java, it's object with a capital O. Objective, uh, Objective C, it's NS object. In C sharp, it's object with a lowercase o. Um, but you get the point. Now notice in object, we have a whole bunch of methods. These are the methods that are deemed to be the minimal methods that must exist for an object to exist. Everything else, like fraction, gets all this crap plus the things that make it a fraction, the things that we do to it that specialize it. And we notice that there is one method in here called toString. It's very important to us. The toString method returns a string representation of an object. Well, if we, if I give you a random object and I say, what should the string representation of this object be? What makes the most sense is probably going to be the one thing that's common amongst all objects. And that's that they all live in memory somewhere. Does that make sense? If I give you a fraction, we can say, okay, well, a fraction, if it's a fraction one half, maybe we display it as one slash two, and that's one half. Makes sense for a human being. Okay. What if I give you a X, Y, Z, A, B, C object? How should that guy look? Come on, you all know what an X, Y, Z, A, B, C object is, don't you? We've been playing with those since we were kids. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a made-up thing, right? Okay, All of the objects we might make up in Java might be made-up things. So this idea, this two-string method that's implemented in the object class, this guy displays, it returns as a string, the memory address of an object. So if I come into my code here, and we already showed this, c string. if I printed that out, that guy's a string, so it calls the string version of um, uh, println. But if I print out c1 here, c1 is an object. It happens to be a checker, but a checker is an object. So when I pass that object to the println method, it's going to take that object and do the only thing it knows how to do. That is, call that object's toString method and see what happens. Does that make sense? And what does it boil down to? It boils down to a memory address. But now, I can come into checker, and I can create a method, public string to string, and have this guy just return color for right now. So I'm going to get rid of this display method. So what I've done is I've overridden the two-string method that I inherited from my parent. I received, as a checker, I received a two-string method that my parent object had created for me. I decided I wasn't happy with that. I decided it wasn't good enough for me to, um, uh, it wasn't good enough for uh, me to display a memory address. I'd like to display something that makes more sense. So I'd like it to display the color of the checker. Make sense? So now, just by adding this one function here and changing, well, I need to get rid of the two display calls since I deleted that, but changing nothing here, you'll see that now these guys display red and black. No longer display memory addresses. 
Because just like variables, methods resolve to their most local definition. So when I say C2 dot two string, it's going to check inside the checker class because C2 is a checker. And it's going to check in here and see if there's a two string method. If there wasn't, which there wasn't before, if it doesn't find one there, then it's going to check inside the parents class. It'll keep walking up the chain until it finally gets to the top. That is, until it gets to object where there is no parent. If it runs out of places there, then it yells at us. So if I try to call c1.abcxyz uh, method, which we probably can make a pretty decent guess doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, C1 is a checker, so we're going to look inside checker first for the ABCXYZ method. I don't see one in here. But wait, there's still hope. Let's check our parent, object. Well, let's refer back to the, here's object. We'll scroll through here real quick, looking for an ABCXYZ method. I didn't look that close, but there's not one there. <laughs> and at that point, that's when it decided, okay, buddy. I didn't find this guy. There is no ABCXYZ method. So try again. Yet, right now, notice that there is still a two string method, even though I did not define it inside of checker. It couldn't find it here, so it looked inside object and it found one there. So it called objects two string method, because checker is an object. Checker has everything that objects have. And then it has a little bit more. Specifically, it has a color. That make sense? So if I want a checker to have a certain kind of display to it, I would write its own two-string method that returns whatever it means for this guy to be a checker. So in the big scheme of things, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this guy return uh, color dot char at zero. as a string, so it'll return either an R or a B. That makes sense? Okay. So now if I say C1, print out C1, print out C2, it'll automatically call the two string method and we'll get our R and B. Make sense? Okay. So. Now let's talk about inheritance a little bit. Let's look at it from the perspective of why we might need it in this particular case. Let's say that, um, let me do it this way. Static. Boolean is red checker, checker C. So let's say I have a method called is red checker that takes a checker as a parameter and returns true if the checker that I passed it is a red checker and false otherwise. Now, forget that you even know this stuff exists because it doesn't matter who calls this guy, right? This is a, right now, this is a method definition. It's an untapped resource until we actually call it. So as far as we write, know right now, C is some checker. Might be a black checker, might be a red checker. We need to somehow determine, using only what's in here, whether or not C is a red checker or a black checker. How do we determine that? If C equal what? Like this? Yeah. Okay, tell me why that's a horrible solution. <laughs> what is C? Well, it's, it's a checker. Now forget about that you're not returning the right thing. What is C? C is a checker, correct? 
What is this? String. So right off the bat, I'm asking, is a checker equal to a string? It already doesn't make sense, right? What you really want to say is C's color the same as black. Okay, well, how do I get C's color? See that what? It's the problem. Color's private. See that two string? Okay, right, we can we can do that. So you're gonna get C dot two string, which gives us a string, right? What are we gonna do with that? Is equal to what? Equal to the string red? Just gonna give us R or B. Like that. Do you want to return that? All right. Well, this is a Boolean expression, right? Oh, it's, it's yep. Right. So if this is if this equal to this is true, it'll do, it'll return that. Okay. So println driver dot is red checker, and I'll pass it C one. That should return true, correct? What about driver dot is red checker C2? Return false. Return false for both of them. Why? Why can't I do that? What is that guy that I have highlighted there? Equivalence operator, right? What is it built to compare? Remember when we looked at primitive yeah. Boolean operators? Yeah. This is for primitive types. What's a primitive type? Only can hold a value. A variable type built into the language that can only hold a value. So these guys compare primitive types. But now notice that this didn't give me an error though, right? It didn't give me the result I expected, but it did not give me an error. Why? Well, it didn't give me an error because it's not an error. Hold on. That, it's not wrong from a syntax perspective to use the double equal sign to compare this guy to this guy. It's not syntactically incorrect. It's logically incorrect. It's not solving the problem we want it to solve. But it is legal code. Yet, I said that this guy is only built for comparing primitive types. No, nope. Don't tell me how to fix it. Tell me why I don't have an error. This isn't giving us the result we wanted, but it's also not giving us an error. What am I actually doing here? What will it return for that? It's actually a trick. It's actually a trick question. No. No? Why did you think it why did you think it returned true? Don't worry, he'll get it wrong. What's this going to return?
What's this going to return? It is a different address. Yeah. But it's very interesting. Why did it return false for S equal to S2 when I built it this way? Yet it returned true when I said string S3 is equal to R, string S4 is equal to R. Now it's true, right? Mm -hmm. Well, hold on. What do you mean it deals with the value inside? Because, well, by, I'm using the same double equal sign. Mm -hmm. S ultimately points to a place in memory that has an R there, right? Mm -hmm. So, so well, let's, let's draw this. All right? I told you to. Let's draw this real quick. All right. So. All right, so we have we have our R, and we're gonna so for string S, we string S is equal to a new string R, and what's new? What's the new keyword do? Real estate agent. Okay, perfect. So we're going to create our variable S. S is going to get some memory address. So let's say, here, let's just, let's just use an equal sign on it. S equals, let's say, 100 for the memory address. And that's actually going to be a dude that, dude, that points there. For example. Okay. Now we're going to create S2. S2, use the new keyword. What's the new keyword do? Real estate agent gives us a memory address. So let's say the memory address that guy returns is memory address 475. So there's our 475. So then I ask the question, S equal equal S2? Uh, specifically this. Double equal sign compares the values that a primitive type holds, right? What value does S hold? 100. 100. What value does S2 hold? 475. Does 100 equal 475? These are two different memory addresses. Therefore, we get a false. Correct? Okay. And here's our, our proof. Here's our S. Here's our S2. And we get a couple of falses. Make sense? All right. Now, we'll create our S3. <coughs> Question mark next to that guy for right now. And our S4. And we're saying S3 is equal to R, and we're saying S4 is equal to R, but we're not using the new keyword, right? Okay. S3 is equal to R, S4 is equal to R, but not using the new keyword. So if we do S3 here, and I do S4 here, we're getting a couple of trues. 
My question is, is what happens if I were to say return, and we've seen this already, r equal to r? That's a true statement, right? Is there any way you could look at that and say that's not true? The thing that's on the left is literally identical to the thing that's on the right. Those are true. They're identical. What's S3? Variable. What's S4? Variable. What's the value that S3 holds? R. So it gets a little tricky when you deal with strings. Strings are kind of a special case. S3, as defined this way, is a variable that holds a value, and the value it holds is R. But it's an object. Don't objects hold memory addresses? I didn't use new. That's true. This guy is something called, uh, well, actually I would probably call it a string literal. So built into the Java language, built into the virtual machine, they've given us this, what I call syntactic sugar, a way to conveniently create strings this way rather than using the new keyword. That make sense? Okay, they, they've provided that service to us. But now here's the issue. If I don't use the new keyword, and I just do this, I am forced to let Java do whatever they think needs to be done to fake this like this. And what Java does is they create a literal string R and put it into memory somewhere. But when I do this, they don't recreate that. It's the same memory location. I only got a new memory location when I specifically asked for a real estate agent to go find me some memory. When I let Java do it automatically, it was smart enough to say, oh, well, it's the same value. It's, it's only in one place. That's why S3 equal S4 is true, but S2 equal to S, uh, S equal to S2 is false. But now, let's create a third checker. So we think we got our, we think we got this? New checker, red. So we got three checkers, red, black, red. And I don't need to print these out right here. Actually, we will. Okay, so let's see what's the way I want to ask this. Let's change this to is same checker, same color checker, is same color checker. So this is going to take in a checker C1 and a checker C2. And we want to return true if they're the same color and false otherwise. Make sense? Okay. Well, we might say return C1 equal equal C2. But we know that this isn't going to work because these were all built using the new keyword, correct? They are all built using the new keyword. So we know, even if they're the same color, C1 will have a different memory address than C2. Correct? Mm -hmm. But now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a getter, public string get color. And this guy is going to return this dot color. Okay. What will happen if I say C1 dot get color equal to C2 dot get color?
So if I call that pass and get C1 and C2, which C1 is a red, red checker, C2 is a black checker, it'll be false, right? So I'm going to pass C1 and C2 into is same color checker. It'll come in here. We'll ask C1, what's your color? Then it's going to give me the string red. We'll ask C2, what's your color? We're going to get the string black. And no matter how we look at it, those aren't the same string, right? So this is going to give me a false. There's the false. No matter how we look at it, whether it's comparing the actual strings or not, C1 and C2 definitely have different memory addresses, if it's a memory address, because they came from two separate objects. And even if they don't, they definitely hold different literals. There's no way those guys are the same. What if I change it to C1, C3? I built C1 with the literal red. I built C3 with the literal red. What's this going to return? Well, that doesn't matter. Well, we, what I really want you to be thinking about is the literals we compared before. If I compared R to R, it was true. If I said string S equals R and string S2 equals R, and I compared S to S2, it was also true. But if I said string S is equal to new string R and string S2 is equal to new string S2, I got a false when I compared them. Am I saying new string here? Yeah. Right here, what I have highlighted? That's a string literal, is it not? This is getting passed into the constructor for checker right here, and we're just setting that guy to it. I'm not using new with any of the strings. So the question is, is if I pass in a checker that was built using the string literal red, and another checker, a different checker, that was built using the string literal red, will this guy return true that they are the same color? Yeah. Make sense? It's a very dangerous concept. Okay, It's the difference between comparing memory addresses and comparing values. You think I understand it? Okay, ready for your question then? So right here, we just saw it return true, right? Is it require is it is it comparing a memory address or is it comparing a value? So you're saying sometimes it compares value, sometimes it compares memory addresses? So the, the equivalence operator just kind of on the fly decides what, how he wants to look at stuff. No. Like, look, you know, it just depends on my, depends on my mood. <laughs> Sometimes I like to go all the way to the memory address level and compare them. Sometimes I just kind of glance at the values. No, that's not Almost the right answer, but the exact opposite. say something that means something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they don't always compare values. They always compare memory addresses. Okay. It's always. Now, in this particular case, the value is the memory address. So I, it, you could, it could be a little confusing, although I think you were lost. Now yeah. you just lost me. <laughs> <laughs> so. In this example, do they use the same memory address? They do. It's not that red here and red here are the same value. They are. They are the same value. But the fact is that since I built them using the literal red, they, this guy and this guy literally are at the same memory address. So if you spelt the one If I the said red. new string red and I said new string red 
Oh, okay. So the new is putting it in a new location. Get it? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. It's always comparing memory addresses. Now, this is kind of the interesting way of explaining something I talked about once before. I kind of ripped on Java textbooks where they say, oh, pointers don't exist in Java. And I made the comment and said, it's not that pointers don't exist, it's that everything's a pointer in Java. Does that make sense? And we just proved it. If we specifically ask the Java virtual machine to go get us some new memory, when we use a double equal sign, they're not going to be the same. They are in different memory places, different memory locations. But if I rely on the virtual machine to build my literal, like, look, I need a string that says red. Do what you can. Now you are at the mercy of how Java decides is the right way to do that. And if, let's say I use the string literal red a thousand times in my program. I'm just, I'm just using a, a, big, uh, a big number. So let's say I happen to use the string literal red a thousand times in my program. From an efficiency point of view, is it better for Java to create a thousand separate copies of the string literal red or create it once and give them all the pointer to it? Yeah. Create it once and give them all the pointer. That's why they made that decision. Okay? So now, C1 is built with the string literal red. C3 is built with brand new memory address red. Make sense? The new keyword is a user requesting a chunk of memory. When we don't use the new keyword with things that are objects, we rely on Java to figure it out. And what Java does is it says, okay, well, you want the string literal red. You want the string literal red. I'm going to put it here and let both of you point to it. That make sense? And the thing is, this is actually consistent with how they handle the other primitive types. So let's finish this, uh, you know, finish this round of knocking out the textbooks. Again, I said, everything in Java is a pointer. So we just proved it with string literals, right? What happens if I say 1 equal to 1? Is that a true statement? Yeah, super true, right? <laughs> Doesn't get much truer than that. Well, what if I say int i is equal to 1, int j is equal to 1, and then say i equal equal j? Also true, right? 1 is a literal. It's not a string literal, it's an int literal, but it's still a literal. One is also a literal. So I need to, I'm representing the number one two different times here, right? What if I was representing the number one a thousand different times? Is it in Java's best interest to store it a thousand individual times, or is it in Java's best interest to store it once? Yeah. Store it once, right? So all variables resolve to the most local definition. So when I say i here, i boils down to its value, correct? What's the value of i? True. It's a memory address. We don't have a way of getting to it. But the value of i is a memory address. i holds a memory address, and that memory address points to an int literal. That make sense? Well, by draw it. There's our one. So if we say int i is equal to one, and we say int j is equal to one, what actually happens is one gets created somewhere up here in memory. Let's say it's at memory address uh, 2, 214. And then our i is equal to 214, and j is equal to 214. i and j actually hold memory addresses that, when followed, take you to the literal, the value. 
Okay? So we have to resolve this memory address to get to the actual value. And that's how computers work to begin with. Everything, no matter what kind of value you're storing, has to be stored in memory. We can't just say, well, primitive types, I mean, they're not objects, so we don't need to keep them in memory. We'll find them when we need them. Right? That's not the way it works. Computers store crap in memory. Everything at some point has to be in memory. So Java has just proven to us that it consistently handles literals. One, the literal one, as soon as you bring that symbol into existence inside your program, it creates it, puts it in memory, and remembers that it already exists. So anything else that you set equal to the literal one will point to that exact same place. So we're not reusing space. The reality is, is with ints, though, it's like a wash. Memory address is 32 bits, and int is 32 bits. Right, might as well just store the int five times. Right? But at least this way we can be consistent. Go ahead. So is that why it's in like computers or... Is that why it seems like... I guess I mean, uh, the whole thing of it, it's always storing like, things in memory. So it, it makes it look like your computer is intelligent or, or is learning something. And then you constantly, kind of like in the, towards the AI perspective. Well, uh, not, not in this case. I mean, this is, this is just literally brute memorization. You know, when you run your program and you create, the first time you have the symbol one show up, it has to throw that in memory during the run of your program. Every program has part of memory associated with it that that program can use. Um, so, you know, like, let's say you walked, in, you woke up in the morning and your mind was blank. Okay? And all of a sudden I said, okay, remember the number seven. Seven. You throw it somewhere. Throw it somewhere. And I said, okay, now, now, now remember the number seven again. I said, ah, okay, I already got it. You already got it. <laughs> now remember the seven again. It's there. I got it. Now remember a four. Okay, threw a four up there. See what I'm saying? Yeah. But then as soon as you go back to sleep, wake up the next day, you're a new blank slate. I know that's not how it works, but <laughs> get, get what I'm saying. Um, you know, at that point, you have to start all over and start loading things into memory again. Uh, so the idea here is what we're, what we're proving is that Java does not store a literal any more than once. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, hold on. You mean when I had both of these? If I did C1, C2, these two, and I passed C1 and C2, well, you're asking why is that false? Yeah. Well, they're, they're different literals. This is the literal red. And so this is like, if she wakes up in the morning and says, okay, remember red. I said, okay, I'll throw red up there. Now remember black. Okay, I'll throw black over here. They are in different locations because they're different literals. If I told her to remember red twice, it's like, remember red. Here's red. Remember red. Oh, I already got it. It's here. Java, Java allows us to represent literals for all the primitive types as well as strings. They treat strings as a special case. No other object. We can't, there, are, there is not another object that we can represent as a literal. Far, I mean, I'm 99. Point, I'm as I'm as positive as I can be, based on my experience with Java. I can't name another object that allows you to do things at the level at the level of a literal. Uh, but don't don't necessarily say we have a pointer here and another pointer here. It, it's true we do, but it has nothing to do with that. I mean, because a pointer is a memory address, right? All I'm saying here is 
By the way, Java, don't just do your default thing you do with literals. I want you to actually store a separate copy of red. Okay? So, like, if she wakes up in the morning and says, okay, remember red. Got it. Now, remember another copy of red. Don't just remember the one I already gave you. Keep track of red someplace else. Like, well, this is the original red. This is our newer red. They're both red. They both have the same... They both ultimately resolve to the same string of, stream of characters, but they are different reds. Two red crayons. Does that make sense? And we can see the echo echo position. We can use it actually define like for the primitives to turn on from there to the memory address. The memory addresses are primitives. A pointer is a primitive type value for storing a memory address. So the correct thing to say is that the double equal sign, the equivalence operator, can be used only to compare primitive types. So when I use it with two objects, I'm comparing their primitive type value, which is their memory address. That makes sense? Okay, so a really cool way of uh, um, exploring the lies that those textbooks are telling you. Have any of you actually gone and looked at a Java textbook and seen this? this uh, they say it very often. Just find it very funny. Um, okay. Well, here, let me just go back to that. Now, to make this work correctly, I would use the dot equals method that comes with the string class. The dot equals method does not compare memory addresses. It compares two strings to each other in terms of their content. It doesn't care where in memory those strings are. If they're in the same place, great. If they're in two separate pointers, fine. It's going to look at each individual character, case sensitive and all, and compare them for being the identical string in terms of contents. Okay? So now I can pass checker C1, checker C2 in here, and it's going to compare the color of the first one to the color of the second one in terms of the content of the color, not its memory address. So now it, I can compare C1 to C2, and it'll be false. Those are not the same color. And I compare C1 to C3. Now this will be true. They are not the same memory address, right? But they definitely are the same color. So there's our true. Does that make sense? So the dot equals is what we use for comparing one string to another string. And it's not like some special thing. It's something the string class provides for us. Java.lang, go down to string. So this is not like a, a crazy made up thing that the Java language has given us just in case. This is a method that the string class has provided to us for the very reason that we are using it. Because comparing Because comparing uh, strings to each other with a double equal sign compares the pointers, the memory addresses. So we would probably find it helpful to compare strings in terms of content. That seems like something that would be fairly common. To find out if one string says the same thing as another string. Therefore, the person who wrote the string class included that. Make sense? Okay. Now, my argument, though, is you're not allowed to use get color. You're not allowed to use two string for checker. Just follow me here. So we have our checker. Checker holds a single string private field called color. 
We can build a checker, passing it as color, and it sets that private field. That's all we can do inside of checker. We are not allowed to write any more code inside of the checker class right now. Yet, I want you to make the is same color checker method work. How could we do that? I can no longer ask a checker to give us its color. The grandfather's father. <laughs> just, just when in doubt, throw around random, random, random family tree references. <laughs> um, so you want us to make the same color checker method, but without using the two string. Well, I want you to make it work. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, we're going to do it as a class. Oh. Yeah, I'm not not a quiz or anything. I mean, we're going to do it as a class because I mean, I'm. I want you to try to help me write this method, given the restrictions I just gave us by removing all the crap from Checker. So I'm saying for right now, we cannot change Checker. This is what Checker must look like to solve this problem. And the problem I want to solve is I want to have a method that I can pass two Checkers to. And it returns true if they're the same color and false otherwise. How can I possibly do that right now? No. That'll compare the addresses because there's two objects. Well, is there anything that we know about? There isn't a way to do this. I can't do this. The object-oriented way of doing this is to see if two checkers are the same kind of checker. Is this. I'm going to create another class. I'm going to call this guy a red checker. Okay? And I'm going to say a red checker extends checker. He is a checker. Okay? And then I'm going to say public red checker is the constructor super red. I'm going to create another class. Well, actually, let's just do it with red checker for a second. I won't, I won't confuse things with black checker. So here's what a red checker is. A red checker extends checker, has a constructor that takes no parameters, and automatically <laughs> asks his parent to build a checker with red as the value. Okay, so that's my red checker. I haven't changed checker at all. Checker still holds a private variable called color. We're probably going to change that a little bit here in a second, but it's not important for right now. And has a public constructor that takes a string as a parameter. So I'm going to say checker C1 is equal new checker red. Checker C2, checker C3. I'm going to say checker, let me see, sorry, red checker C4 is equal to new red checker. That makes sense? So I created a new object. Variable name is C4 of type red checker. I call the red checker's constructor that takes no parameters. And what does the red checker's constructor do? It says, take no parameters, but just go ahead and call my parent's constructor, passing it the string literal red. Well, who's my parent? My parent 
is checker. And what does checker's constructor do? It takes in a string and sets the color to that string. Make sense? Huh? It'll call the one that matches the one you called. I called one that takes a single string as a parameter. So if there's another one that takes two integers and a string as a parameter, and I pass it two integers as in a string, it'll it'll call the one that matches it. All right. So now, what we can do, I'm going to create a, another class for black checker now. So new class. Black checker. And black checker also extends checker. And it calls the parents constructor and passes it black. So that's our black checker. Now, wouldn't you say that rather that it's significantly easier here to create red and black checkers than it is to create checkers passing out red and black? So I could say black checker BC1 is equal to a new black checker. I can say black checker BC2 is equal to a new black checker. I could say red checker RC1 is equal to a new red checker. Red checker RC2 is equal to a new red checker. Then I can pass in BC1 and BC2 into my is same color checker. Now let me ask you this. BC1 is a black checker, correct? BC2 is a black checker. Am I allowed to pass BC1 in when the guy is expecting me to pass in a checker? So here's the, here's the object oriented question. Is a black checker a checker? It's a true statement. A black checker is a checker. How do we know? Because it extends checker. Make sense? All of us in here are humans. Some of us are male, some of us are female. That makes sense? Kind of that same thing. If a human being is allowed to go into a store, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you're allowed to go into the store because you're human. Make sense? Okay, so it's the exact same uh, thing we're doing here. So given that, does it ever make sense to create a checker? In real life, we don't create generic humans, right? We have males and we have females. You don't have this like third category, like human. <laughs> Deal with you later, right? Males and females, we, we, we get more specific. So it is actually nonsensical to ever create an instance of checker. Checker only exists as a convenience for us to have red checker and black checker. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, for right now, we're going to choose not to use checkers. In a few minutes, I'll show you how we can formally prevent us from creating uh, instances of checkers. So now, back to what we were trying to do, finding out if two checkers are the same color. Well, I can ask 
a question. If C1 dot get class is equal to C2 dot get class, well, I can just return that actually. C1, C2. So I'm going to return whether or not these guys are both of the same class. Might get a little interesting here. So, BC1, BC2, are they of the same class? No. Black checker, black checker? They're both black checkers, right? Yeah. So they are the same class. This can be true. RC1, RC2, same class? What about BC1 and RC2? So class represents our most local class. Mm -hmm. Well, but the, 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 the thing here, though, would be BC1 is a black checker, RC2 is a red checker, but they're both checkers. Make sense? They are both checkers. So when I asked to compare the classes of those two guys... There was some question as to whether or not C1's class is the same as C2's class, given that they are both still checkers. Okay, I'm going to show you another operator that we haven't seen before called the instance of operator. <laughs> What's up? Okay. So... <laughs> Let me, let me actually ask this in a separate method just to show it to you real quick. Static boolean is red checker. Okay, so we have a function here called is red checker that takes in a generic checker, anything that's a checker, and this guy returns C instance of red checker. I can put that in parentheses if that makes you feel better. It's not needed, but maybe it looks a little more specific. So this will return true if whatever checker I passed in is indeed an instance of the red checker class. Is black checker will return true if whatever I passed in is an instance of black checker. So just system dot out dot println driver dot is red checker bc1 should be false, right? A black checker is not a red checker. RC1, though, is a red checker. So I should get false, then I should get true. Make sense? So I'm passing a black checker into is red checker, and it's telling me not a red checker. I'm passing a red checker into is red checker, saying, yep, that's a red checker. Similarly, I can call is black checker on both of these guys, and it'll work the exact opposite. A black checker is a black checker, a red checker is not, so it should be true, then false. Okay. Finally, I could ask the question in here. If they're the same color, then C1 is a red checker and C2 is a red checker, or C1 is a black checker and C2 is a black checker. 
that means they're the same color. So I can say return C1 driver dot is red checker C1 and driver dot is red checker C2. So if that's true, or they're both black checkers, So return, they're both red checkers or they're both black checkers. Does that make sense? If they're both red checkers, then they're the same color. Or if they're both red black checkers, then they're the same color. If neither of those is true, then that must mean I have one red and one black checker. Make sense? All right, then the very last thing, like I said, it would be nice We've, we've behaved, and we've made sure to not create instances of checkers. But we have a, in object-oriented languages, we have a keyword called abstract. And the abstract keyword says, you cannot create an instance of this. And let me show you an example of that real quick. So I'll take abstract off just for a second, and I'll come into driver, and I'll go ahead and quickly create an instance of checker, even though it doesn't make any sense. We'll say checker c1 is equal to new checker, and I'll pick my favorite bang on the keys color. All right, so we'll make it a red checker so it looks legit. All right, perfectly legal right now, right? Not yelling about anything? Yet, yeah. I'll come in here. I'll make this guy abstract. Just by making that abstract, I'm now no longer allowed to do this. Cannot instantiate the type checker. So when you create a class and you make it an abstract class, what you're basically saying is this class only exists to support inheritance. And it only exists for me to build other objects that extend this guy. I never intend to make an instance of this guy. Make sense? So we formalize that by making this abstract. It's not required. It's kind of like self-policing. The very last thing we should do is remember when we talked about public, private, protected? We want to go ahead and we want to make our color protected. Private means we can only access it within this class. That is, the class name checker. Protected means we can access it within the class name checker or children of the class. So what we just did there is we exposed color to red checkers and black checkers. So now they have access to their color variable, their color field. That makes sense? All right, questions about any of that? All right, let's talk about the homework assignment real quick and call it quits. Abstract makes a class uninstantiable. You cannot create an instance of the class. Let's see, homework seven. Okay. So, for homework number seven, you're going to create a class called deck that represents a deck of 52 playing cards. The deck should be able to shuffle itself, display itself, and deal a card. Dealing a card should return the card from the top of the deck. Dealing a card twice in a row should not return the same card. So, if you play cards, like poker or something, if you don't know how to do that, just Google it. You know, if I shuffle the deck, randomize it, 
and then I deal a card off the top of the deck, and then I deal another one, they should not be the same card, right? <laughs> Make sense what you're trying to accomplish here? Um, that is to say that dealing a card changes the position of the top of the deck. Test your card and deck classes thoroughly. Make sure you submit your code as a zipped folder and not as a not Java files. Okay. If you want, you can paste all your code one class after another in there. If you prefer that, or just zip up the folder and submit the folder. Okay. Um, questions about what I'm asking you to do there. So that assignment actually is a fairly easy assignment in the big scheme of things. It's much more about practicing with objects than it is about solving an algorithmic problem. Make sense? Okay. So everybody understand what I'm asking you to do in that one? All right. And finally, I guess your last paper. Report number seven. Write a three to five page paper discussing the role of object-oriented programming in modern programming solutions. How does OOP, object-oriented programming, compare to procedural programming? Is procedural programming dead? Discuss the history of object-oriented programming. What was the first object-oriented programming language, and what was the motivation to create it? How did object-oriented programming languages evolve? What do you predict to be the next evolution in computer programming? Should be a fun paper. Well, I gave you lots of things to address in your three to five page paper. All right, questions about any of that? All right, so I'll see all of you next Wednesday night. We will have a full class. We got some more crap to go through, and then we'll talk about the final uh, um, project, and uh, we'll firm up when I want it due and that kind of stuff. But you know. I'll give you at least two weeks. I might just make it January 3rd or something, so it carries you through the new year. If you decide you want to go on a bender and start working on it January 2nd, that's your... <laughs> All right, I will see everybody next week.